1800s America moved at a horse and buggy pace. Evansville was no exception. People often lived within walking distance of where they worked. Factory owners and factory workers frequently lived only blocks apart and walked to work together. Around 1900, all that began to change. With the introduction of the automobile, Americans quickly altered their lifestyle. Over the past 100 years, the car had transformed the way we live. Indiana was home to many early auto manufacturers. The turn of the century brought an industrial boom to Evansville. Furniture plants employed thousands of Evansville workers while an infant auto industry was born. Before Chrysler became Evansville's major automobile manufacturer, there were several firms that built horseless buggies. Will Copeland had a small factory prior to 1910 and built the Simplicity and the Traveler. For a short time in 1907 and 1908, Hercules Buggy built horseless carriages for Sears and Roebuck. About 10 years later, in 1920, Ray, Bob, and Joe Graham, natives of Petersburg, Indiana, opened their Graham truck plant on Stringtown Road. Later, this would be the home of Evansville Chrysler. In the early 1920s, Graham Brothers was the leading truck producer in the country. In 1924, 11,000 of their Graham trucks were built. The Grahams would also use the Dodge Brothers drivetrains to power their vehicles. By the mid-1920s, the Dodge Brothers bought out the Grahams, acquiring the Stringtown plant with the purchase. Later, Chrysler would acquire the plant when it absorbed the Dodge Brothers in 1928. The Chrysler Dodge Corporation continued building Dodge trucks in Evansville until the Great Depression struck. In the early 1930s, as people lost their jobs, they also cut back on their spending. Due to slow sales, Chrysler Dodge stopped operations in Evansville at that time. But on June 19, 1935, Chrysler announced it would reopen the Stringtown plant and produce Plymouth automobiles. Briggs Manufacturing Company would also open a plant in the old Graham Page body plant on Columbia, providing car bodies for the new Plymouths. A special road was built in between both plants so that they could transfer automobiles from one plant to the other. The plants officially opened their doors on October 23, 1935. Because of Chrysler's fiscal management, they fared better during the Depression than many auto manufacturers. At the opening of the plant, Chrysler promised that 3,000 workers would be needed by January 1, 1936, and 5,000 would then be employed within a year of that. Wages paid by Chrysler were some of the highest industrial wages in the area. Even with the Depression, people were still buying cars. By 1937, sales had reached nearly 4 million. In those years before World War II, Chrysler hit its peak in sales and production. Both plants were averaging over 400 cars produced a day, and on at least one occasion, 100 an hour were produced. Always looking to save money, Chrysler quickly utilized the Ohio River as a cheap way to deliver their cars. The major buyers from the Evansville plant would be from the Gulf states and the Southwest. The river proved to be an effective way to deliver the finished product to the buyers. This means of transportation was much cheaper than transporting by train, which was the universal way to move cars to and from plants and their future buyers. It was during the early 1940s that drastic events would change the production and labor at the Chrysler and Briggs plants. While Europe and Asia were engulfed in the Second World War, Evansville was having its own problems. The American Federation of Labor, or the AFL, accused the Congress of Industrialized Organizations, also known as the CIO, of having communist influence. Despite that, Chrysler still built their Plymouth automobile, but that would soon change. On December 7, 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was pulled into World War II. Many automobile plants around the country would get the war order, and Chrysler was no exception. On June 4, 1942, Evansville received the order to produce 45 and 30 caliber rounds, 
and other specialty ammunition styles. Briggs was given the order to produce the wing sections on the Corsair fighter plane and P-47 Thunderbolt wings constructed at the New Republic Aviation Plant, also in Evansville. In less than six months, the Chrysler plant would be making millions of steel-cased cartridges for combat use in the military. By September of 1943, 12,500 men and women were employed at the plants. These ordnance workers performed one of eight different jobs at the Chrysler plant. Most of them manufactured over 3 billion 45 caliber cartridges. The ammunition was then packed and shipped to the Pacific and European fronts. Other employees made 30 caliber bullets. 500 million artillery shells were also manufactured. The Chrysler Corporation performed another service for the Army. 1,662 Sherman tanks were brought to Evansville for reconditioning, as well as 4,000 Army trucks. Near the end of the war, the plant was given the order to create 7 million firebombs, but thankfully, these were never used because the war had quickly ended. As World War II came to an end, Chrysler returned to making the Plymouth and Briggs would begin to make the wing sections for the Grumman Albatross transport plane, as well as producing Plymouth auto bodies. The 1950s would spell the end of Chrysler's operation in Evansville. In November of that year, other unions in Evansville black-labeled the UAW at the Chrysler plant communistic. Workers within the UAW disagreed entirely. In 1953, the one millionth Chrysler Plymouth was produced, and Evansville's economy peaked. Over 50,000 workers were employed in the city's industries. Also, a new drastic change to car manufacturing would forever impact industry at the plant and in Evansville in general. Car manufacturers, including Chrysler, were allowing for more options on their cars. Two color choices, a choice of horsepower, transmission, and interior finishing could be selected by the buyer. These choices made it impossible to produce stock cars that had every available option. Car Industries decided to produce catalogs that a buyer could order a car with any choices available to that vehicle. The order would then be sent to the manufacturer for the auto to be completed. This meant that a good number of the cars being produced at the time were custom. Confusion occurred on a massive scale in the factories, since normal production was no longer a possibility. Each car on the production line would differ from the one before it. They could no longer have a normal assembly line. Evansville's Plymouth plant was greatly affected by this new change because people did not want to wait weeks or possibly even months for delivery. During the early months of 1957, rumors began to spread about the possible closure of the two plants. The company denied the rumor, but employees were noticing that the plants were not trying to become more technologically advanced like other car manufacturers of the time. At the same time, Chrysler was home to many wildcat strikes. At any time when a worker felt that he or she wasn't getting paid enough or the right benefits, they would go on strike. This halted production on more than one occasion because of the union having so much control in Evansville. That fall, Chrysler made the decision to leave Evansville and move farther west, near St. Louis, Missouri. You no, know, we all, everybody had a chance to go to St. Louis if they wanted to go. <clears throat> but uh, like your mother died with me, they choose not to go, and, and I did too, and so. But uh, we got a phase of, a severance pay. And they, they said if you draw it all out, you wouldn't be entitled to a retirement. Other plants such as International Harvester Refrigeration, Cervell, and others were also shutting their production down. Many jobs. Nearly 25,000 workers between the three plants would be lost due to the closure. In 1959, the Chrysler plants were officially sold, and the only automobile producer left in Indiana was Studebaker in South Bend, thus ending a promising venture in the auto industry of Evansville. 38 years later, in 1997, Toyota decided to move to the area. 
Although not in Evansville, but in Princeton, Indiana, Toyota is an important contribution to Evansville's economy. Many people from the city work there, and possibly, 40 years earlier, those workers had family members who worked at the Chrysler plant.